All right, in this session we're going to be talking about outreach, um, the, 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 the work of the church. Uh, kind of, it kind of goes hand in hand with the last um, lesson about um, the church's function. So first, uh, first off, discipleship means one who is taught. And this should be should be important to us because we as disciples should always be being taught. We should always be growing. We should always be adapting and 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 and, and uh, we shouldn't ever become in a place of stagnant or knowing it all or having all the answers. Or this is a bad place to be in as a Christian. Um, instead, we need to be. Um, excuse me. We need to be taught. John thirteen thirty five. You know, even Peter, after the church had been started, messed up, and Paul had to rebuke him. Even Peter. So, uh, John 13, 35, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Um, not those people who necessarily like you, but that you love one another. So, um, meeting with the church doesn't make you Christ's disciple. Going to church doesn't make you doesn't make you a, a Christian. That's just that's just false. Um, going through the motions doesn't either. It, just because you you uh, you say your prayers and you do and you read your Bible and these different things, that doesn't make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, you know, people do this whole quoted prayer nonsense, and they think that that that, that oh, well, I quoted my prayers, I said my Hail Marys. That doesn't matter. You need a relationship with Jesus Christ. I mean, goodness sakes, there's a lot of people in, in my community that are Catholics in name only. They don't actually practice the doctrine, and it surprises me because they think that just going through motions is going to save them. Well, that's the same thing the Jews are doing, and they're not saved. We are saved through relationship with Jesus Christ. So, um, 1 Corinthians uh, 5, 9-13 says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all mean the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy or the swindlers or idolaters. In, in that case, you would have to leave this world. But now I am writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral um, or greedy, an adulterer, or slander, or a drunkard, or a swindler. Do not even eat with these people. Um, with such people. What he's saying here is not those people who are struggling and, and they're actually genuinely trying. He's talking about people who accept these processes. They're going to justify the things that they're doing because they're saved by grace. Don't even associate with these people. Um, so, oops. Um, disciples are teachable. They can be taught something. They they listen. They teach others. They 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 seek to make other people disciples. They seek to increase that. It's like it's like a pyramid scheme, except instead of you know selling them something that they'll never get, you're actually <laughs> you're actually helping them to 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 become a better person, to to grow in Christ. Um, so. Uh, and they are submitted to Christ's way of life. A disciple doesn't do things his way. He's not looking for what's best for him. He understands that his life is not about pleasure for himself. Our life is not about pleasure for ourselves. It's not about what feels good. It's not about what's good for us. It's about serving God and loving other people. Loving God, loving people. That's what it's about. It's a two-way street of being taught and being te and teaching. It's a continual process, though. Discipleship is never something that we arrive. If you are if you are saved, you are a disciple. You are growing. You are growing others. Um, so I, I hope that this kind of clears up maybe some ideas that you had from about discipleship. Um, disciples train others who in turn train others. I, I mentioned that. Um, I, a changed life is the greatest testimony, not perfection, but striving after the Lord. Understand that. A changed life is the greatest testimony. It doesn't matter if you're perfect, but it matters that you're seeking after the Lord and that you put your faith and trust in Him. Yes, I did mess up, but I'm a Christian. That's I mean, I'm a person. That's what I do. People are going to mess up. That's that's what they do. But you have to put your faith and trust in Christ. Okay. So it's about it's about that seeking after the Lord that you find peace and and not not in the fact that you keep messing up, not in the fact that you've resigned yourself to messing up, but that you trust God and you lean on Him. Um, so it's not living in sin, um, but still being human. And I think I mentioned this somewhere else. You are still human even though you are a disciple. Um, so there is a difference there. Um, Romans uh, 8.14 <laughs> says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. So um, you never arrive. Keep pressing on. 
to Christ. Keep pressing um, under Christ. Um, and for that, um, Hebrews. If I could say Hebrews in one in one sentence, it would be um, keep. It would be focus on Christ. That's that's what I think Hebrews really focus on Christ. And you know, he spends a whole book talking about keeping your eyes on Christ, and then he gets to the end and says these different things. Well, how do you do those different things? By seeking after God. See what I mean? Like, it's a process. We seek God. See, and, and, and so that's what we're doing, right? And then God changes us, and he, uh, he, he his Holy Spirit uh, brings things to our attention. But then he also gives us the grace to be able to do those things. He gives us that power to be able to do the things. Um, and then when we choose not to, which becomes easier and easier to choose to do it, and I'll talk about this in a future lesson, as we seek after the Lord. But as we choose not to do that, um, you know, uh, the, 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 it, it builds up walls between us and God, and you know, whenever we choose to disobey God, it always builds up walls between us and, us and Him. But hopefully you see what I'm saying here. Um, but that um, it, it's a process that you just keep doing, um, that you keep growing, that you keep moving forward. Um, it's one who is taught. Um, so uh, Hebrews 6. I never think that think that someone's uh, you, someone is below you. Oh, I can't receive knowledge from them because I'm, they're below me. Land that drinks in the rain, um, often falling on it, um, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. Uh, once again, uh, war warning about um, you know, God does expect a return on his on his disciples. You know, in the parable that Jesus tells, with where he gives the where he gives the money to his um, looks like I'm peeking through like this. Hello. Um, in the in the in the story that Jesus uh, tells. Um, or the parable, it's not, it didn't really happen. Parables are not real, okay? They're just stories to prove a point. Um, and, the, and the parable that, that, that Jesus tells where he leaves the, the three um, servants with different amounts of money, um, the one that just kept the money safe, that didn't increase it, was called wicked. We're not called to just keep something. God gives us talents to go and use the talents, okay? God gives us things to use them, Um and we are definitely called to increase those things. So, discipleship is a, is a lifestyle of continual growth in the Lord. That's what makes Christianity Christianity. We are continually growing towards Christ. So, Hebrews 10, um, <coughs> excuse me, 22 through 24 says, Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who pr promised is faithful, uh, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. So I'm going to go ahead and stop there. Um, yeah. So, it is a lifestyle of continual growth. It's, it's not simply that something that we do once, but it's a lifestyle. It's, it's, a, it's a habit. Okay, so let's talk about evangelism. Um, this is the the actually outreach part of an outreach. Uh, and you know, it, it's actually there in the name outreach. Outreach. You're reaching out. Okay. Um, oftentimes we think of outreaches as those things that that just um, you know, are within the church themselves, and we hold the things at the church, and therefore the people in the church. Well, that's not an outreach, is it? An outreach is an outreach. You're doing something somewhere else for someone else. See what I mean? It's outreach. You are assembling together as the church, but then you are going out to do things. What we try to do is we try to have outreaches that are at our church for the people in our church. I'll give you an example. Um, there was a disagreement between some people between whether we should call our, our Halloween um, activity a harvest fest or a Halloween um, um, or Halloween, and and basically what it came came down to is are we appealing to those people who are already in church, or are we appealing to those people who are not in church? Um, and I do want to clarify something. Halloween does not mean what you think it means. Do some research on it, and you know, I'll, this isn't the place, the time or the place to talk about that but i'll probably post something on my on my blog when it comes closer to halloween time um 
Anyways, um, evangelism is all about there you are, not here we are. Okay? Um, it, it, it's not, here's our, here's our ministries, we're just expecting people to walk into the front door. Um, and I'm not saying you shouldn't meet together and, and have services and those kinds of things, but we should definitely not only do things within the confines of the four walls. Oh, I do a lot for God. I, I teach Sunday school, and I do this, and I do this, and this, this, this. Right, and, and when exactly have you last invited someone from the church into your home to, to have fellowship together? When have you last witnessed to your, to your co-workers? When have you last done anything outside of the church to, to, to impact other people? See, what we're doing is we're showing up this model of, here we are, come to us to hear the gospel, rather than let's go to them and tell them the gospel. Because we're impacting people who are on drugs, who are in alcohol, who are in sexual adultery. These are things that, 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 that the atmosphere of, of America is changing, and we're going to have to adapt to it and find some way to become relevant for them. I'm not saying change the message. I'm saying change the method. Change the method. We don't need to be seeker-sensitive churches. We don't need to, to, to get rid of all references to Christ in our songs. We don't need to do all these things to make it more acceptable truth. We need to present the same truth, but we need to do it in love. And how do you present something in love? By reaching people where they are rather than expecting for them to, re to be able to come to where you are to understand the gospel. This is the exact same thing that the Catholic Church did with the Vulgate. The Bible has to be in Latin. Well, nobody speaks Latin anymore. It doesn't matter. They, they shouldn't be reading the Bible themselves. Anyways, the, 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 the priest should be reading it. No, the Bible is for everyone. The Bible was written in a form of Greek called koine. What that means is common, basically. It was written in the Greek that the commoners spoke, not the high and mighty spoke. I mean, goodness sakes. Um, anyways, uh... Hmm. And we'll talk about that. Uh, first, let me read 1 Corinthians 9.23. And it says, I do this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Okay? I do this for the sake of the gospel. To the weak I became weak. He's not saying that you change who you are or, 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 or that you change what you do. He, let me say that differently. He's not saying that you change who you are or that you change what your message is. He's just saying he changed how he presented his message. Okay? Um, for when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast since I am compelled to preach. I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. Trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this: that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge, and so not make full and so not make full use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel. See, he had rights, and he was continually giving up our right and giving up his rights. What the American church does is they have they have rights and they cling to them. I have the right of free speech, and that gives me the right to say anything dumb that I want as soon as it hits my head. American rights are not the same as Christian rights. You don't have to be a Republican. You don't have to be white. You don't have to be, you know, uh, conservative. These are things that you don't have to be to be saved. All that you need to be to be saved is faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. So. Okay. Um, and then down there, uh, to those not having the law, I became like one not uh, one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. So what he's saying is he didn't leave, live lawless. He didn't live lawless. But for those who were unaware of, of the Old Testament, he didn't use it as a basis. What do we do when we witness to people? Oh, the Bible says. Well, if they don't believe the Bible, what good is it going to do to quote the Bible? See, this is why it's important to know things like science and to know things like that. Because when you're talking to an atheist, what are they going to hold to? Science. So talk to them on their level. Talk to them about something that they understand. Science. See what I mean? We're not saying, here we are. We're saying, there you are. How can I present the gospel in such a way where you're going to hear it and understand it and be given a genuine chance? A genuine chance to believe. But what we do is we sit in our church in our golden tower and we say, you have to come here, you have to dress just right, you have to do all the things just right, just to hear the message of the gospel. What if they don't know that your church is any different than the Jehovah's Witness? What if they go to Jehovah's Witness first? What if they're in a place of need and somebody comes knocking on their door? Because you were not at the church that were, you were supposed to and called to be. Does that make sense? I, I hope it is. Um,
and my dad's in uh, in surgery, and um, I was keeping it on just in case uh, you know anything happened. Um, but um, anyways. So I'm, I'm getting off topic, though. I, I hope that you understand the direction I'm going. Ministry should be about other people, not about ourselves. So there's a few different kinds of ministry. There's traditional. Traditional is the things that the people used to do and, and, and is common in, in churches nowadays. There's street, street witnessing. This is where you know you, you run into people on the street. I would highly discourage this because in today's society, um, in America, that is, um, it's actually becoming more of a thing of just irritating people and causing people to not listen. Okay, most of the time this doesn't work. Even like things like Jehovah's Witness and stuff are facing less, um, um, less uh, positive um, experiences with this. Um, <clears throat> services, you know, we have our Sunday morning, our Sunday night, and all these different things. Hospital visits, missions trips, preaching—these are good things. Okay, but. By themselves, they are insufficient. Okay. Then there's non-traditional ministry. This is where you don't necessarily say Jesus; you show Jesus. Okay. There is a big difference. Sometimes we say Jesus, but we don't show Jesus. But then sometimes we go to the other extreme and just show Jesus instead of show and say Jesus. And nowadays, I was I was teaching in my in, in my young adults um, um, class. And I, I said, you know, how do you think you create a voice to witness? And they all pretty much came to the conclusion of don't set out to witness like street witnessing. Um, say um, j just simply show Christ in the way that you live. And then um, all of them overlook – well, I'm not going to get too much into this. But it was just kind of funny because I asked a series of questions and um, one of them was, you know um, – um, uh, the role of the Holy Spirit in witnessing and all these different things. Um, and then I s asked um, why they didn't witness and these kinds of things. And it was because, oh, I'm shy and all these different things. And I said, do you not see the overlap? You need the Holy Spirit so that you can go out and, and, um, and witness. And then once you're witnessing, the Holy Spirit will guide you in those things. Um, and then uh, you will be able to show Jesus and say Jesus. And I said, that's awful convenient that all of you guys came up with a solution that didn't cause you to... Uh, and I said it as a joke. I, I, hope that, I hope that this isn't offending anyone. I wasn't meaning to offend anybody. But um, I, was, I, I, I told them, I said, it's awful convenient that your solution to witnessing didn't resolve the issue that all of you are too scared to witness. <laughs> See what I mean? We're, we're, we're creating solutions to work around not having the Holy Spirit. Hear me on this. We are creating solutions where we don't have to wait on the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you something about the Holy Spirit. He's inconvenient. Hear me on this. It is inconvenient. You're going to have to change the way you do your services. You're going to have to change the way you do your witnessing. You're going to have to wait on Him. That's inconvenient. It's easier to go and do things your own way. I'm not going to lie to you. But the payoff is more rewarding than anything you could ever imagine. Because when the Holy Spirit guides something, it is successful. Even if the person doesn't hear what you're saying and doesn't listen, it was led by the Holy Spirit, and that makes it successful. That's what made it successful, because you went and you said what Christ told you to say. Does that make sense? It's different. But it is it is hard to do, especially in mega churches. You've got everything down to schedule, and you've had the schedule all year sometimes in some mega churches, and not however you want to do your services, whatever. But when we schedule the Holy Spirit out of the service to make things flow better, that's when we've got when we've got a problem. When we're when we're used to the fact that we don't have the Spirit, and so we work in our ministry things where we don't have to have to go out and witness, we have a problem when that happens because we're working around not having the Holy Spirit. That's not how you do ministry. The Holy Spirit is how you do ministry. It's central to ministry. Um, so in these different things, food pantries, uh, community services, counseling services, uh, having things held at, held at your church even. Like um, we just had a thing for senior citizens that had nothing to do with God, but they had to, they were able to do it in uh, at our church. And, and it was great for the community. The elder people in, in the community felt like they were appreciated. They felt like they were needed. And, and it was, so the church got good, good publicity, but more important than that, it fulfilled a need that the community had. It showed Christ, even without even mentioning God. See what I'm saying? Um, lifestyle. This is a great, obviously, great ways to witness, but it's not the only way to witness. Um, attitudes, prayer. These are all good, good ways of non-traditional witnessing, but the, each one is insufficient by itself. You can't just show Christ. You can't just say Christ. You need to do both. Okay. 
become to those Hey, you can't possibly – Dave Ramsey, for instance, he's a really good teacher on finances for middle-class white people. For those people in our community, the poor, the brown, it doesn't work. They come from a poor from a poor family. They are poor. They can't – a lot of times they can't even find a job. Not anything against them, but there just aren't that many jobs around here. See what I mean? So teaching the Dave Ramsey course isn't going to be that great a benefit. See what I mean? Um in the same way when you're teaching Christ you don't say it for let me tell you something I went to Bible college learning how to and this was my goal to learn how to how to how to t preach and teach for the intellectually elite then God called me here where there aren't a whole lot of intellectual elite I'm dealing with a whole bunch of people who are just normal people it's not like they're idiots or anything they're just normal everyday people a lot of times they didn't finish call, uh, high school. A lot of the times they didn't go to college. They're just people. They're farmers. They're, they're, they're good people. They're nice people. And I'm having to completely change everything I worked so hard to learn to show them that just because you're a good person doesn't mean that you're a saved person. That is extremely difficult when you spent years trying to be, trying to uh, perfect your, your message to the intellectually elite. That is very difficult. You have to watch how you say things. When, when, you, you can't say things in Christianese. Oh, we're having communion. What's communion? Well, you know, the Lord's Supper. Well, what's that? Hey, we're having this event at Susan's house. Well, who's Susan? See what I mean? We, we say things and we do things as though we're saying and doing it for ourselves. There is no outreach in the process. So I'm, I'm getting a little bit off topic, but... Um, anyways, I was just joking about the, about the young adults uh, thing. They, when I said it, they, they understood what I was saying. They understood that... To do ministry is not enough to just have, have to just show God through your life as, as convenient as that is. You also have to say about God. But how do you know when to say and when to just do? The leading of the Holy Spirit. He guides you in that. You don't compartmentalize God. You have God over everything. So uh, be tactful and wise in, in your in your witnessing. You can say the exact same thing with a different attitude in a different way. And they'll listen. Or you could say, "And you sinners," and they won't listen. Okay? You can either say, "You sinner," or you can say, "How can I show them Christ's love? How can I show them that?" Okay? Um, understand judgment and, that, and, and love and those kinds of things. God does not enjoy judgment. God does not wait and stand over a person grinding his, uh, you know, uh, uh, I can't wait for them to mess up again so I can bring destruction on them. That's not God. Goodness sakes. Yet we, as his body, are doing that. The book of Revelation, for instance, wasn't given to the world. It was given to the church for the sake of encouraging, not to scare people. Goodness sakes. There are so few of books of the Bible that were uh, – parts of the Bible that were given to, given to uh, the world, and they were only given to the world in the sense of trying to draw them, to restore them in a relationship with God, like Nahum. Um, anyways, um, be tactful and wise. You can say the same thing in just a better way. And some people will say, "Oh, you're 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 sugarcoating the gospel. You're you're um you're um uh, you're, you're trying to be politically correct." No, not at all. I'm just trying to make knowledge acceptable. Proverbs says this: May, "The wise person makes knowledge acceptable. It makes it acceptable for the person, rather than saying it in an offensive way. That's not wise. That's stupid." You're going to hell if you don't believe in Jesus. Yes, that is true. If you do not, if you are not saved, the only other option is punishment. I, I, I accept that, and that is true. But you don't have to say it like that. You don't have to get joy from telling people how America's going down the pot. Well, maybe America's morals are going down the pot because you have a church who's 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 wanting to be served and only either going to the extremes of preaching only love or only hate. There is a middle balance there. God is a God of love, but He's also a God of judgment. So I mean, we need to have balance in our, in our in our witnessing, and we need to do it in a tactful and wise way. This person, for instance, came from a Catholic background, but he isn't actually part of the Catholic Church. He just did the motions of the Catholicism. Okay, I'm not downgrading Catholics. I'm downgrading thinking that you're secure by that thing that you do. And so he's burnt out, just totally burnt out from doing the things. So what am I going to highlight? I'm going to highlight the fact that you are saved simply by faith. Nothing you do will ever add to that salvation or take away from that salvation. God loves you with an everlasting love. See what I mean? 
Now I've just related the gospel on a level that you can relate to. But sometimes we as American Christians get so caught into the fact that we're Americans that we forget the fact that we're Christians foremost, not Americans foremost. Goodness sakes, read what Paul says about the people who are being Romans first and then Christians, or Gentiles first and then Christians, or Jews first and then Christians. We're called to be Christians first and then American, okay? So, um, be tactful and wise. I mean, you can say the same thing in a different way and they'll accept it. There's no reason to be to be offensive. And I showed this to someone uh, who, who disagreed with me the, uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, you know, he was saying about um, how that, and I said something very offensive. And I said it in the worst way I humanly possibly could just to offend him. Um, and then after I said it, you know, obviously it had offended him. And I said, look, see how I offended you? Do you see what I've done? I've offended you. I've pushed my own Christian brother away. How much more do we do that to people who aren't even of the body? And obviously I did apologize because there is – I, in hindsight, I shouldn't have done it because even to prove a point, it's not worth it, even to prove a point. It's better to just pray for them. It is better. But – I did do that, and I was able to show him how I could have told him the exact same thing in a non-offensive way, but I said something in a purposely offensive way, and that's sometimes what we do in witnessing. We, we're, we're so so nervous that we're going to say something politically correct that that we that we um, that we say things offensively. Well, you don't need to go to that extreme either. Um, and uh, we're wrapping up here. Uh, this is um, I got this slide on the next slide, and then um, that's it. So, um, we'll finish up this, this on, on another lesson uh, for another time. Um, okay. All right, be genuine. Nobody likes a fake. And for those people who oh, I'm blessed all the time now, here's the difference. You can you can say that like there's a person there's a lady in our church that says this all the time. I'm blessed every time you ask her how she is. I'm blessed. What she means is this. I may not feel great all the time, but I know that God's word says that I'm blessed. And that's true. God's word does say that I'm blessed. She's not ignoring the fault that she has problems. What I'm talking about are the people who say this, oh no, I have no problems. I'm perfectly fine just the way I am. And, and, and you know, hey, everything's fine and everything's fine all the time. People can tell when you're being gen being fake and when you're being genuine. Not like that, but people can tell when you resent them, okay? People aren't, aren't stupid. They can tell the underlying attitude that's being said, okay? So when, if you're talking to somebody and you hate them in your heart, they're going to be able to pick up on that. If not the first encounter, the second one for sure. Especially if they, if they see that you're not just you know an a-hole. You're that's actually that's how you talk to people. So um, be genuine. Nobody likes a fake. Uh, people can tell it doesn't reinforce the message of Christ. It just pretends Christians don't have struggles. You don't have to pretend that Christians don't have struggles. Goodness sakes, that excludes half of what Paul wrote about. Hey, I'm in prison. I've been beaten this many times. I've been this and this and this and this. You know, hey, um, all these different things that, that, that are bad. The fight that Mark had with Barnabas over Mark and Acts. These are all things that, that are – these are actual events. Christians have problems. Sometimes they have more problems because they have to tr trust God rather than take care of themselves. This is what people do. Christians do. They don't pray about it. They take care of it themselves, and then when once they get themselves into a pickle, then, then they pray about it. But then they try to get themselves out of the pickle. So if someone asks you a hard question, be honest. When, when you're witnessing, I don't know, but I can try to find out. Uh, this is in a book I just read. Um, I think The Questions Christians Hope No One Will Ask by Mark Middleberg. I, I could be wrong, but I think that's the one I read it in. Um, I, I can try to find out. Uh, stay on track. Sometimes people will, will bring up all these questions, and they're great questions. But sometimes it's just a distraction from the message of Christ. They don't actually care about the answer, and when you give them the answer, they don't really even care. They'll bring up another question. See what I mean? And, and sometimes it's good to answer the questions, but sometimes it's good to notice that the questions, they're just using it as a smoke screen. Okay? Stay on point and, and know what your purpose is and only answer questions that have to do with the, with the actual message. But there are some times that you need to be discerning this, and by answering the message, you a, answering the questions, you actually open them up for it, um, for the gospel. So be discerning and, and try to find out when. Um, uh, when it's which and when it's the other. So um, also realize that you can't always be prepared. Sometimes Christians don't witness because they're not prepared or I just don't know what if they ask me something. Just be honest and be real and be led by the Holy Spirit. It's that simple. You, they, you, you will, there will be a point when you're not prepared. Let's just face facts here. But you're not called to always be prepared. You're called to, uh, to um, 
to do what God told you to do. So reach out to people and rely on the Holy Spirit to guide you. It's not about you. Um, oh, I don't have time to witness right now. It's not about you. If you're rejected, keep going. If this person rejected me, I'm going to stop now. What about all those other people who won't reject you? See, what happens in ministry is we get our, our, our minds focused on one aspect of excuse me, one aspect of something that didn't go well. And we lose sight of all those other things that are going well, or that are, or are that, that, that we can impact. Um, so, don't lose sight of the many who will accept for the one that didn't. Um, always, all, uh, here's a very important, always assume they will come around, eventually. Yeah, I, the, the bad thing about being a Baptist is sometimes you get the idea with predestination that some people... Um, I'm not. A, I'm not a Baptist, and I had no problem with Baptist. Calvinists actually is, is what I'm talking about. Um, but what I have a problem with is when Calvinists just write people off. Oh well, they they aren't going to be saved anyways. Oh, they were never saved anyways. You should never have that attitude in ministry. You should always have this attitude. I do want to. I I I, I do want to say something. You know, Baptist Calvinism doesn't actually teach that you can live however you want and you're always saved. Once saved, always saved. They don't actually teach that. They teach that if you don't, if there is no genuine tr change in your life, then that is just evidence that you were never truly saved. Okay. Um, they uh, they say for those person people who go out, go back and do exactly the same things that they were doing, that person was never really saved. Now, obviously, as an Arminianist, I would strongly disagree with that, but um, I don't think that it really matters in the long run how you understand predestination. Um, I think that it's very clear that, that God does know who will be saved. God knows who will be saved. In fact, d does it matter about the rest? No. Christ died for everyone. Jesus was sent to the world for the world. So, um, regardless of how you understand the different pieces, it, it makes the same clock. So, um, always assume that they will come around eventually. So be led by the Holy Spirit, but don't write them off when, if they reject. Don't write them off. You have no right to get offended in ministry. This is something a pastor, uh, my pastor told me once, and I have never forgotten it. You have no right to get offended in ministry, because ministry isn't about you. It's about them. It's about God. Your life isn't about you. It's about God. You have no reason, no right to get offended. You have given up that right because you are now Christ's property. Find a way. Find a way to serve them. Okay, find a way. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That's just a fact of life. That's not just a ministry. That that that's generally speaking. Sometimes our our teenage kids lose sight of that when we we start squabbling about a bunch of little things, the music that they listen to, the way they do their hair, the way they dress, and we let these little things build walls between us and our kids, where they no longer see us as Parents, they see us as simply judges, and uh, we do need to we do need to have order in our home, but we don't need to only have order. So realize your words won't save. Also, um, uh, when you're witnessing, your words will never bring someone to salvation. It's not the words; it's the Holy Spirit. God does the work. You're just simply His tool. Never forget that. Um, it's about God's kingdom and his glory. It's all about that. It's not about us. I mean, you really can't say this enough times. I'm going to stop there, um, but I am going to read uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 1-6. through 6. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you. I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration and demonstration of the Spirit's power. I did not come to you knowing everything or saying it all in the right way, but with the power of the Spirit. So that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. But on God's power, not human wisdom. Not what I could do, what God did. Make sense? So, uh, also Proverbs 14.4. Where there are no oxen, the manger is empty, but from the strength of an ox come abundant harvests. When you do ministry, it'll be messy. There'll be crap. But there's not just crap. And things do get done where there's crap. 
where you have oxen, it's going to be messy. Where you have people minister, this is how you have your perfect ministry in your perfect world. You 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 build a build, per, building, perfect building. You completely clean the building, and then you lock it and never let anyone go in it, especially yourself. That's how you have a perfect church, because that's nothing but an empty building. Church is going to be messy because it, it, the church is people, real people with real problems. That's how it is. So are you probably going to get some some drug addicts in who who uh, you know come to church high? Yeah, probably. Um, if you're doing grill ministry. If you don't have cigarette butts in your parking lot, you're probably not doing ministry. Whoa! Yeah. If you don't have people with, uh, who are, have tattoos all over their face, you probably aren't doing ministry. If you don't have somebody occasionally come in drunk, and blah, 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 then you're probably not doing ministry. If you don't have kids who weren't grown up and growing up in, in, in the church, you're probably not doing ministry. You want to change America so bad? Change the kids. You reach the kids. Because those kids turn into adults, and those adults are going to be the leaders of America when they grow up. So you want to change America? You do something about it by loving on kids. You love those kids. You teach. You 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 give the gospel to everyone, to the poor, to the rich. You don't ever show show um, personal favoritism. That's something James strongly warned about. It's not about you. It's about God's kingdom and His glory. It's about doing things for him. So, um, with that being said, um, never forget what your purpose is. Never forget that. And never forget that it is going to be messy and, and that that's...